Now, Harry Hurley. Pat, am I allowed to rent those pipes of yours? Are they for rent by the minute? I promise to be brief. My name's Harry Hurley. It's great to be here today. I drove uh, today to the luncheon with really just such a great feeling with my great friend, Ed Hurst, Hall of Famer. And I'm even happier now because sometimes when you're in a business for a number of decades and you wonder, is the next generation going to bring it up? And are they going to take the mantle? And are they going to do what needs to be done to preserve this incredible industry that we've been blessed to be a part of? As Pat said, to be able to make a living doing something you love. When I was a little boy, my father told me, find something you love to do. And like Pat said, you'll never work a day in your life. So at age 30, I quit a vice presidency. People thought I was clinically insane. I liked my job, but I didn't love my job. I got, the, I got bitten by the passion of radio, and I have loved it for the past 22 years. I quit my job. I've been able to provide for a family, raise three children, and now I'm a grandfather. And I, I stand before you today, and I think all the seasoned members of the broadcast pioneers in this room that probably have several thousand years of combined experience in our wonderful industry can say, after seeing these 17 great young adults, that the future is in good hands. This, this is a real treat for me because these are three legends that I will introduce one by one. The first speaker will be Bill Roswell, Director of Digital News and Media at KYW News Radio. Our second speaker will be Jim Loftus, Vice President for CBS Radio and their Philadelphia group. And my father had another slogan that if you want something done right, you give it to a busy person. He, Jim has more jobs than anybody I've ever met. It's unbelievable. And uh, batting third, uh, just a tremendous leader and contributor that not only contributes materially for 25 years in the Delaware Valley, but her work has taken her national and international, the great Monica Malpass. <laughs> Who doesn't remember, we met about 23 or so years ago at a Philadelphia Phillies game. She was 10, I was 12. <laughs> and uh, she's so classy and so good, all of our speakers. It's my honor to welcome Bill, Bill Roswell, as many know, Bill helped to perfect the iconic all news all the time. And you know, somebody groaned about it, but when something is in your head, they own and occupy space in your head. And it's terrific. Bill, if you'll come on up and address this great group. It's my honor to present Bill Roswell. All right. Everybody sing the jingle. One, two, ah, no, you've got to wait for me to direct it. One, two, three, four. KYW News Radio 1060. Oh, thank you. I love that sound. Um, I want to say congratulations to all those scholarship winners, especially those from my alma mater, Rowan, when it was Glassboro State College. My daughter went to Cabrini, but thanks to their parents for supporting them because it all starts with the family. I mean, I got hooked on radio when I was about 10 years old, and my mom and dad for Christmas gave me this Remco radio that my dad had to help me put together. Sat there at night with a set of headphones, and we could only pick up one station living in Washington, D.C., and that was uh, WRC Radio with Willard Scott and Ed Walker, who did this program called The Joy Boys. And they would make up these characters in these skits, and you would just you could see in your mind what they were talking about, and that's what got me hooked on radio. Went to Cherry Hill West, um, did the uh, morning announcements over the PA system. We called it the 810 Report. Um, it went on at 8.05. We called it the 810 Report so we could get everybody's attention. Um, <laughs> one of the thrills I had in, in high school was um, we put had record hops there at the school. Everybody our age remembers record hops and dances at the schools. One of the people who would come out and do the record hops for us about once a month, once a month was George Michael of WFIL, who lived in Cherry Hill. 
George would come out and do record hops. He would record promos when he was at the station on his way home, drop him off at my house. I would take him in the next morning and play him over the school PA system to promote the dances. Um, for the scholarship winners, take advantage of as many internships and opportunities as you can, but don't go in and say you'll work for nothing. If you're valuable enough to have the talent and the energy and the zeal and the passion for this business, you deserve to get paid something for it. May not be a lot starting out, but don't sell yourself short and say that you'll, you'll work for nothing. Um, it's been a great career for me, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna take up a lot of time because a couple of people back there have more experience and better pipes and better looking than I am. Um, it's been a great time. I started at KYW Radio in 1980, the day John Lennon was shot. Started December 8th, 1980, he was shot that night. Came in the next morning, the new kid on the block was sitting at the editorial meeting, and the boss, Ed Belkin, says, anybody have any local angles? And I said, well, there's a guy I went to high school with who was, is playing the, the role of John Lennon in the National Touring Company of Beatlemania. He said, oh, great, great, try to track him down. So I called his mom up, found out he was down in Houston, called him on the phone, did tape with him, and they put it on the radio my second day on the air there, which was great. Turns out it was, his name was Bobby Williford, who's the brother of WOGL's Tommy McCarthy. So, and he was, you know, Bobby's still a musician. Um, seen some great things, got to go to Rome again in April. Um, a lot different between what happened, what we saw in 2005 when I was there covering it, and what we had in 2013. Um, talked to TJ Thaddeus Jones. He works in the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. That's the office that Archbishop Foley ran when he was over there before he became Cardinal. Um, I, I just sent him a note saying, What's, what was different between 2005 and 2013? In 2013, they accredited 4,000 jurors, I'm sorry, 2005, they accredited 4,000 journalists. In 2013, they accredited 6,000, so there were more people there. And TJ said the big difference was the types of journalists who were reporting. You had bloggers, you had people who had done websites, who were just web only, uh, in addition to the radio and television uh, and print reporters who were there. Um, there's only three people at KYW Radio who have gotten to see two papal elections. The first was Richard Maloney in 1978, who was there when Pope John Paul was elected. He wasn't Pope John Paul the first, he was just Pope John Paul. Then 30 days later went back for the election of Pope John Paul II. Um, Mark Abrams and I were there in 2005, and then again in 2013. The most amazing thing, both times when we were there, was People knew when they could expect to see smoke coming out of the Sistine Chapel of the, of the, uh, at the Vatican there. They knew the time schedules for the balloting. They knew when the cardinals were gonna be meeting. So you would see maybe a thousand people gathered in St. Peter's Square, and then it would quickly grow to several thousand because they knew, hey, there might be smoke coming out here. We gotta see what's happening. Um, 2005, I remember being on a cell phone with the station. I was on the air with Don Lancer at the time, one of our broadcast pioneer Hall of Fame members. Um, and saying to Don over the radio, no, this is white smoke. This is definitely white smoke. We weren't sure because they said the bell was supposed to ring when they sent up the white smoke. It took 10 minutes for the bells to ring. When it finally did, we were on the air live. I asked Cardinal Foley later uh, that, that year, what took them so long to get the bells to ring? He says, well, let me tell you, Vatican bureaucracy at its best. <laughs> Swiss Guard was told by one of the cardinals, okay, we have an election, go over and tell the bell ringer, ring the bell. Poor Swiss Guard comes out of the Sistine Chapel, goes across into St. Peter's Basilica, all the way across the front, upstairs to the bell tower, goes up to the guy who's in charge of ringing the bell and says, okay, they sent me over here, they've elected a pope, ring the bell. Bell ringer looks at him and says, you're not my boss, I don't take my job, my orders from you, I'm not ringing anything. Goes back, poor guy has to go back over to the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> the chief cardinal gets on the phone, calls the boss at the bell of, of the bell ringer, says, hi, this is Cardinal so-and-so. I just sent one of the Swiss Guard members over there to tell the bell ringer to ring the bell. Now, ring the damn bell. <laughs> Took 10 minutes before that happened. This time in 2013, there was no doubt that it was black smoke or white smoke. 
I, and the bells rang instantly. The most amazing thing to see is when the bells start going off, and they not only go off in, in the Vatican, but all across Rome and the, the entire country, was to see people just stopping their cars in the middle of the street, anywhere they could park, people running down the streets. You have a couple of thousand people there in the square starting out. It quickly fills like that to 100, 200,000. Imagine an area in front of Independence Hall that stretches all the way over to the Ben Franklin Bridge. That's the area of St. Peter's Square there. Imagine that filled with 200,000 people at a moment's notice. And just to be able to see it once, but twice was, was, a, was a great thrill for me. Um, I'm available for questions later on if you have any. If you have any quick ones now, I can answer them. If not, I'm gonna turn it over to my boss, Jim Loftus. No questions? Good, thank you. <laughs> Coming up next is Jim Loftus, Vice President for CBS Radio and their fine group of radio stations. And he brings, obviously, everybody knows in the room that knows Jim, his integrity, decades of great work. And uh, as I mentioned, my father's favorite expression, I do believe that uh, Jim has lived up to and does, in fact, uh, embody. It's a pleasure to welcome Jim Loftus. Well, good afternoon, folks. <laughs> well, uh, to the students, congratulations, and uh, the award recipients. Uh, very, very happy to see the Broadcast Pioneers supporting education. I myself uh, was a teacher for many, many years in the communications field as an adjunct, uh, taught about 18 years between uh, Temple University and Marywood University. Uh, basically, what I'd like to talk to you about today is just a, a couple of brief minutes uh, on my own background. I'm in radio 37 years. Uh, it's a long time. July 5th will be 37 years. Uh, June 7th, I'll be 54 years old. So the math says that's two-thirds of my life, uh, which I'm very fortunate. And I know many of you actually have been in the business longer than I, but it's a long time. And I've been continuously employed in the radio business. Uh, I started two weeks after my 18th birthday, and I've been very fortunate. Uh, I myself uh, was one of those kids who was an eight-year-old that wanted to be a disc jockey, and uh, I pursued it. My parents were somewhat supportive, and uh, you had to have an FCC license. They helped me get that license when I was a senior in high school. And when I graduated high school, I just circulated around. I'm from the northeastern Pennsylvania area. I circulated around to every radio and television station. And actually, I got hired to produce the Phillies games. Uh, in the middle of the season, they wanted one person to do every game, run the board for a Phillies affiliate. And fortunately for me, uh, the guy uh, got fired for whatever reason, and it was open in the middle of the season. So they hired me, an 18-year-old kid, to run the board for the Phillies. And uh, a couple of weeks into it, I asked if I could do a live ID instead of playing the recorded ID, which probably you wouldn't be able to do nowadays, but uh, they allowed me to do it. And, you know, I got to say, Phillies baseball on 1440 WCDL, Carbondale, Pennsylvania. And then I, I realized I had time left over. So a couple, of, a couple of games further, I asked if I could start to mention, brought to you by, you know, uh, Jerry Wilkinson Ford and by Bill Roswell, House of Fashions. And I, I, I started working that into the ID. And before long, the sales manager uh, heard this. A couple of clients mentioned it. And they came and said, this guy, we'll put him on the air. And I got afternoon drive. I was uh, a freshman in college, and uh, I did PM drive uh, full time at the radio station for two years while I was uh, in school. Uh, about a year into it, I realized that I, I was of modest talent, especially in this room full of uh, such uh, uh, you know good broadcasters, uh, but that I had a great love for the business. At the same time, I was watching the people in suits at the radio station. They seemed to have nice cars. I like cars. Uh, they they seemed to. Uh, have an interesting lifestyle, and I went and asked the general manager at the station if uh, she would consider giving me an opportunity to try sales. So I guess now I'm a freshman in school, and uh, I'm a, a sophomore, rather, in college, and they let me try sales, and I realized, quickly realized, that I was really made for that job and uh, better at it than I was on the air. They let me still do weekend work, and I did that through college, 
And uh, by, my, by my senior year in college, I was uh, by then really greatly entrenched in being a full-time uh, radio account executive. Um, my parents uh, were uh, public school teachers in Scranton. And my senior year in college, I made more money than my mother or my father. And it worked out, it worked out well for me. So uh, I graduated. I came to Philadelphia. I've been blessed with a, a pretty long career. And uh, for now, uh, I guess 31 years, I have been a manager of people, a hiring manager that uh, you know, uh, deals with that. Uh, today, I'm the vice president general manager of 98.1 WOGL. And I'm the vice president of sales for CBS Radio Philadelphia. Uh, we have uh, five sales departments, 65 sales reps, 14 sales managers, about an 80-person sales department of our 300 uh, staff members at CBS. So what I'd like to talk to you about, really, just for a few minutes, if I, if I may, are about careers in broadcasting, how to get started today. And I thought, because I'm talking to a room with a, a few students, but primarily with broadcast pioneers, I wanted to give you, from my perspective, as someone who deals with this every day, but who more is from your perspective of someone who's a, a, a multi-decades uh, broadcaster uh, himself, uh, that you know, many of us are called upon to advise or mentor people on how do you get started in the business, what do I do, it seems to have changed. What, rather than us say, oh, it's gone to hell in a handbasket, you'll never find a job, do something else, become an accountant, go to law school, all those things that you know, might be reasonable answers to some people, Let's not be the wet blanket. Let's not squelch people's dreams. You know, any one of us can go out and follow our dreams, like these kids did here today that, that did such nice things to qualify and, and get uh, the scholarship from the broadcast pioneers. So I wanted to give you from some perspective on how I think it's changed and how I think that you can help uh, advise, you know, people that are your family members, next door neighbors, people you meet in your churches or synagogues that say to you, uh, you know, such and such, my, my, next, my niece, she's interested in a career in broadcasting. What do you tell them? Well, you know, the way that you used to get started was, you know, you'd go knock on the door of every radio or TV station. You'd bring in a tape. You'd bring in whatever you can do. You'd ask to sweep the floors. You could do what you could do. It's harder to get started that way. Uh, they used to tell you, you know, that, you know, you want to work in Philadelphia, you better go to Shreveport, Louisiana, and then work your way up to, well, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and then maybe you get to Baltimore, and then you can come to Philadelphia. And, you know, if you're going to be an on-the-air uh, radio announcer, if you're going to be a, you want to do mornings, you want to be a television reporter, that's probably the path that you're, you're going to have to take, uh, perhaps. But there are many avenues for young people today to get started right here in our market and right here in any market. And there's basically two avenues that I tell young people are easy ways to get easier ways to get in. The first is through the marketing department. Most radio stations, television stations have street teams. And you know, we employ 30 young people as street team members. I personally interview all the final candidates for our street teams because I want to raise the common denominator level of these young people to come in. We see how they do. We see how they represent the station. They do our events. We might, on a Saturday, between all of CBS Radio and Philly, uh, have eight events. You know, and if it's game day, if it's the Eagles season, because we we are the Eagles Radio Network, or if it's a Phillies home game, we we then might have that, which is sort of all encompassing. So. Uh, I would tell you, look into that. All of these jobs are posted. Everything is on these websites. Go to the websites of the station. Figure out who the marketing directors are. Figure out who the street team coordinators are. Find out about the street team. It's a good way to get in. Yes, it's a small job. It's a part-time job. It's a per diem job. But you're given responsibilities. And then people like me, we look to the street team because they've already passed our background check. They show up for work. We see how they are under pressure. They represent us well or not well. And then those are the people that we will look to hire our full-time positions for. So right now, currently at CBS, I'll bet, I'll bet more than half of the last 10 full-time positions we hired came from our street team. So that's an easier way to think about where a young person, you could do that right now while you're in school, you can do that right now while you're in college, and those of you who get called upon, what do you tell young people? That's one of the things I would recommend. The other is to think about some of the other areas, like IT, digital, and engineering. Uh, not too many people think about those careers and think about how they apply to broadcasting, but in the last five years, uh, you know, a lot of our 
very established broadcasters like Bill have taken on a responsibility to oversee our digital platform and a lot of the young people that we've hired, our digital department uh, has gone from two or three people to ten. So those are jobs that have been created just at one place at CBS Philly. So we're no different. There's probably many jobs like that in a market like Philadelphia and across our industry. Final thing I'd like to talk to you about today is a career in sales. You know, I will tell you that growing up in the 70s and having a family that didn't know anything about the business, radio sales in my family meant Herb Tarlick on WKRP in Cincinnati. It meant the guy in the ugly plaid coat who, you know, who had the, you know, wasn't of the highest moral character and, uh, you know, it wasn't good. Uh, there was somebody in my family who married into my family and he was a pool shark and a radio salesman. And like when I told my father that I was going to take myself off the air and go into sales, it was not good. I, I mean, like it didn't work out. I, but he was heartbroken. And, and really, I mean, it was the right thing for me. But I, I tell you to think about a career in sales because, you know, it's almost impossible to have a full management track inside our business. I've been lucky. I've been managing people since 1982. I was young when I became a manager. I've been a general manager since 1985. And again, never unemployed a day. Knock on wood, thanks be to God. But uh, you take it one day at a time. But um, you know, to get started in that path, if I didn't understand the sales process, and, and still from the perspective of a broadcaster, I don't know that I would have had the same career path that I have. I say to young people, think about a career in sales. I'm not going to tell you it's easy, because it is very difficult. And I'm not going to tell you that there isn't a high failure rate, because there is. But it's one of the few areas in our business where you can get in and instantly become a player at the radio station, where you can be the master of your own destiny, where you can control your own income, where you can write your own career path. And if you understand that part of the process, you know, all the times in all of your careers, certainly in mine in 37 years, that the business has hit the reset button, you know, I mean, when deregulation came, I was a young general manager. When deregulation came, I watched 40% of my colleagues and peers lose their jobs as, as GMs at that time. You know, it just, the business changes. But those who understood how to make a connection between the advertising community and the listeners and to make that connection happen through the sales department, they've been able to endure and, and do very well for themselves. We have a lot of young people who come in and in the first year, you know, one of the things they come back, I've, I can't, I, I'll bet 30 times in the past two years, I've had young people come in and say to me, I made more money than my father last year. And, and I hoped that their father was proud and happy about that, you know, that it wasn't like, you know, they got clocked because of that, you know, when they went home and told them. But it, it's a way in where you can put all the disciplines of your career in communications to work. If you like production, you can voice spots and write copy. If you like events and you have a, a, an interest in marketing, you can do that and you can do those types of clients and focus on those types of things. If you like to create promotions, that's what we do. And you can create events and promotions and create uh, uh, connections around that. Being able to take uh, and understand that we have two constituencies when you run a commercial radio or television station. We have a group of listeners or viewers and we have a group of advertisers. Both are our customers, both are our clients. If you could figure out a way to make a connection between both, you can have a long and brilliant career. Those of you that want to do production, it's a great field. But at CBS Philadelphia, we have five production people. Some of them are there 30 years, they're exemplary at their work, they're not leaving. You know, uh, you want to be on the air, it's very complicated and I don't want to squelch your dreams. I want you to pursue your dreams. But there's a limited number of people and those jobs are hard to get. We have 80 people in our sales department, 80 people, and, and they're doing great and making a lot of money because it's a business that's all about that. And if you work for the right company, they want to promote that. So those of you who are parents, and, and if you have an opportunity, so many people in communications don't know what they want to do. The last thing I'm going to tell you is when these young people start looking for jobs and they start coming to us, coming to the radio stations right around this time of the year, April and May, please, when they, when they say in an interview, they knew somebody, they get somebody in there, they get them in front of me. It's not easy to get in front of me. They get them in front of me. And then, well, I'll do anything. Okay, well, now I guess I have to figure out what that is. You know, figure out what you want to say when you get in there. Even if, you're, if your starting point isn't your finishing point, 
Figure out what job you're going for. Customize your letter. When it's, dear sir or madam, who does the receptionist who opens the mail send the letter to? Dear sir or madam, that's, that's 300 people here that that qualifies for. When you say anything, I just want to get in there, the HR manager doesn't know where to send your resume. I want to do anything. Go on the website. Every radio and TV station has to list every job. Go on the websites. They have robust uh, HR systems. Figure out who they are. Look at the names. Take some time. Call the station. Ask who's the local sales manager? Who's the marketing director? Who's in charge of the street team? Get names. Call and ask for those people. Send a letter specifically to those people. Customize your letter. It takes a moment to do that, please. And then if you do get a letter, uh, an, an interview, a meeting, take a moment and, and analyze a little bit about that station. If it's a television station and news is their specialty, please, how about a couple days before you go in? Watch the news. Get to, get to know everybody who's on that news channel. It, it makes sense. When I have people that sit in front of me and they're at my office here, I have two offices. At CBS has two locations, but my office at WOGL. Well, tell me about WOGL. Well, and, and they don't know anything about it. Well, you're here for a job interview. When were you going to learn? When, when we hired you? So take a moment. You know, may, don't make it difficult. It's hard enough to get started. We put, a, we put a job, we list a job opening, we'll get hundreds of applications. Here's an interesting one. We'll list a job opening for a part-time receptionist, we'll get 300 applications. We list a job opening for an account executive, and sometimes 10. Think about a career in sales. It will open the door for you. You'll put every discipline of your degree in communications to work. And those of you who, you know, people come to you and say, oh, my niece, what should I tell her? Tell her to think about those things. Think about customizing the way she goes about it. Take some time, put some legwork into it, find out who these people are, get names, pursue those people, network with them. It's not so hard to do. Those of us who do this job, if we're so blessed to be hiring managers, people who do this for a living, Someone gave me a break. Someone gave all of you a break. I, I want to be open to communicate and, and listen to young people, but at the same time, I'd like them to not, to, to not have to you know, cut their meat for them. I'd like them to be able to sit in front of me and know a little bit about the television station, radio station, or entity that they're interviewing for. So do a little legwork and think about it. Think about a career in sales, and it'll all work out great. God bless you all. Thank you, Jim. Nice presentation. Our final speaker of the day, it's my pleasure to welcome longtime news anchor, ageless still, Action News WPBI television news anchor, Monica Malpass. Hi, everybody. How are you? Sorry, I know the hour is late, so I will keep it short and sweet, but I want to agree with what all of my colleagues have been saying. And I also want to say to you, I remember how you feel. It's been a while, but I remember that excitement and fear in your belly wondering, how's it all gonna work out? Am I gonna get something that I can't wait to do every single day? I don't wanna be one of those people that gets up, goes to work, comes home, gets up. I can't do that. I wanna run to work, all right? And I want you to run to work, and I want you to just love what you do. Now, that doesn't mean it won't be really hard. It won't take three times as long to get where you want it in the ranks. And it might not be the exact straight path you had in mind. It might be a zigzag. It might be a bit of this. I don't know what configuration yours will take, but I do know this. I agree, by the way, with what my prior or my predecessors just said, that you do have to know a little bit about the company before you walk in. You don't want to sound like they're teaching you and you're trying to work for them, so be advised of what they are up to and what their needs are and what they uh, actually are looking for in the field. But I want to tell you a few truisms that I believe apply to every career. And I tell my, I have three sons, two of them are twin three-year-olds, so they don't really care what I'm saying except no bedtime, you know, no snacks. My 13-year-old is starting to listen. And what I say to him, to anyone who asks me how to get in the business, how do I succeed, I say the same four or five things. Um, and you really have to figure it out for yourself, but I'll try to make it short. And if you even listen to 10%, that'll help you out, hopefully. The first thing, obviously, you're all smart. Anybody in law, medicine, sales, TV, you know, all the big fields, they're all smart, too. They all did really well in school. So smart is key, 
I encourage you to continue your education, to get a graduate degree if that matters to you. Some fields you need that. I encourage you to keep learning all the way through your career. Very important. That is a basic, nobody's going to even blink if you're not smart. You will never get close to the front door. So that's a given. Obviously, be hardworking. Now, a lot of people just think they're going to roll into, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, and New York and be the next big anchor or the next big salesperson or the next big boss. Nobody just rolls in. I can guarantee you every person in this room that's had a storied career, and there are many here and many that had to scoot out, um, have had some bumps along the way and some things they just were like, what? That just happened to me? Don't they know that I was like, this is the valedictorian, the South of Victoria? They, you know, don't they? And they do know, but you still have to prove that you're hardworking. So let me tell you, I did weekends at my first job. That's after I begged for it. Right? I got 50 no's right out of college, and I was an honor student at UNC Chapel Hill with two internships and lots of experience. 50 no's, okay? Every station I applied to, every station I applied to said, no thanks, okay? Well, here's the first key. Every time you go to a speech at your college graduations, they're going to say it. I hope you'll actually hear it. If you really want to do something, whatever it turns out to be for you, just keep trying. Because at some point, somebody, even one of the no's, which is what happened for me, decided they were so sick of hearing from me, more letters, more phone calls. I know you said no last week, but I'm just thinking maybe if someone left the industry, changed locations, moved to California, maybe you'd just like to meet me. And that way in the future, a no might become a maybe, which might become a yes, which is what happened to me. I was the 50 no girl, okay? And then the guy that hired me, and God rest his soul, he passed away doing the job he loved, which was uh, being general manager of our station, said to me the day I got hired, you'll never be the main anchor here. <laughs> that was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina for the NBC affiliate. He was right. I was never the main anchor there, but I moved to Philly and became a main anchor. So in the end, again, it wasn't the straight path. I had figured in the door, they're going to love me. I'm going to rock that place. I'm going to be, you know, whatever. At the time, Jane Pauley, Diane Sawyer. I wasn't the Diane Sawyer of that station, but I had to move. So you have to be persistent. Don't let no be a permanent no. Don't take it as a personal affront. It's just a comma in the story of your life, okay? So don't give up, period, whatever you pick. I mean, don't be mean about it. You got to be sweet, right? Got to be nice and say, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you thinking of me. If something changes for you, I hope you'll think of me again. I mean, be nice, right? As you walk out that door, make them think, I just messed that thing up. I should have hired her. She's a sweetheart, right? All right, so be nice on the way out because you might see them again. It's a very circular world we live in. So besides that, uh, I got the first job finally because I was persistent, and somebody, in fact, did move to California, and then they went, you know what, you keep calling, you keep writing, how bad are you going to be? <laughs> right? I mean, just you're never going that far here. Just get in here and be a part-time reporter and then go work at McDonald's. I swear to God, that's what he told me. And I was a high honor student, okay? So I did go in the door, and I worked really hard, and two months later, somebody else left, and I got to be a full-time reporter. I hadn't been anchoring, right? Are you hearing this? I was the entry-level girl making nothing, told to work at McDonald's to supplement my apartment rent, okay? So you have to be willing to get a part-time job, make it a full-time job. A year later, the weekend anchor left. There I was on that newsroom door. Hi, Mr. Emery. He's like, Ugh. Really? You want to anchor? You've never anchored. I went, I anchored radio. I think I could do this. If you let me have an audition, I think I can do it. And he said, whatever. You line up with the other hundred people that want to anchor, right? Guess what? I got it. I didn't do anything untoward. I got it. I got it because I tried. I didn't give up. And I believed in myself. And I hope you will as well. Um, a year later, I moved to Philly. I've been here 25 years anchoring every single day. So once you get a little foothold, okay, run with that. Okay? Don't be obnoxious. Don't say, now I'm, you know, the anchor of the morning show in Philadelphia. I believe I should be in ABC, NBC, CBS, New York doing evenings. You know, start small, but stay in there. Be persistent. So the second great advantage that I believe all of you have is that you are also flexible. And when somebody says, we're going to need weekends, I know we started you weeknights. Don't always take it as a back step is the end of things. Sometimes it can be a restart on the reset button, as these fellas also said. P.S. in every career, you got to be a little thick-skinned. They all looked at me at the time I was a fluffy brunette, okay? And they said, we don't get your look. What are you? 
what's the hair, what's the, the last name. You in your heart, this is on the on-air portion, if you're doing other things that might not apply, I had to make the choices for myself. What am I willing to change? How am I willing to work with the future company, the place I want to be? How far will I go? So I made the decision back then, straighten the hair, right? Um, change the clothes, beef them up a little bit because I was very humble beginnings. So I spent every dollar I was making part-time being a reporter, beefing it up, straightening the hair. At the time I came to Philadelphia, still a brunette, now I've gone blonde because it's cheaper to color the hair, right? <laughs> The white doesn't show quite as often. But the net result is I'm not willing to have 19 facelifts. I'm not willing to, you know, whatever, hack off my arms and legs. I've made some decisions. What am I willing to do? What I'm willing to do is a little bit of this, whatever feels normal for me, and I hope you'll figure it out for you as well. Um, your industry, I had to change my name for my first radio job. They didn't get Malpass. I wasn't that upset about that, except that nobody knew I was on the air for my college, right? I had 40,000 students at UNC Chapel Hill. None of them had a clue. It would have been nice if one or two friends were like, hey, yo, we heard you in the morning. That was so cool. But nobody ever did. So, uh, my bosses thought Malpass sounded very odd. It is odd. It means pothole. I'm, a, I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, it really does. We researched it. Bad hole in the road. That's what it means. Um, but the good news about that is that every time I think of, I can't do it, I go, you know what? They actually hired somebody with the last name Malpass. Look at me, right? I did it. And that means they're going to hire you and you and you and you. You can do it too. So besides being flexible, besides being persistent, besides uh, trying some things that might not have been the exact way you envisioned it, so a little bit out of your comfort zone, if you will, and being thick-skinned when they say, we don't hire people who wear a pink doll. We don't hire guys with bug buzz cuts. We haven't done that in 30 years. Who do you think you are, right? Whatever it is, whatever it is, they're not gonna, somebody's not gonna like something. And guess what, somebody's can be wrong. Even bosses can be wrong. And it might just be that that day, that time, wasn't for you. That place wasn't your spot. That doesn't mean you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're wrong. I've seen heavyset Oprah Winfrey become the goddess of our industry. I've seen people who were stunningly perfect not make it. I've seen people who were, all the things you would think would be right, it didn't work. It's really very subjective, if you will, and that's not just TV, that's the law profession, the medical profession, it's all a matter of timing, luck, persistence, smarts, and being humble when you get the opportunity, right? And saying thank you so much, a lot, a lot. The final thing I'll tell you is if you can become part of a winning team, I have been lucky enough to work with some of the best, obviously Jim Gardner, but Rick and I, Rick Williams and I, we used to be Monica, Rick and Dave in the mornings, then Monica, Rick and Cecily in the mornings, now Monica and Rick, we're hanging in there, honey. So I'm just saying, if you can be part of a winning team, that is unstoppable because you, plus a lot of smart, determined, kind, flexible, hardworking people, you rock this place. You will be there in no time at all and you're gonna stay. All right, 28 years later, and I hope to keep rocking with you. Thanks. Thank you.